Good morning. It's been such a long time since the first revisiting Walden video. And like I said in my previous video or two videos ago, there was a lot of stuff in personal life that got in the way in work and I did some other videos but I hadn't I hadn't the time to sit down and continue this series. So today we are going to continue with part two. Still on Life in the Woods, Walden and we are still on economy like I said in the first video economy is all about managing the household managing our livelihood it's not about taxes and income rates and gross products and all that so Thoreau gives us some really interesting thoughts and I want to continue with that today and I think we'll finish this part today and I want to start just a few pages after we where we left off and he's talking about architecture and I'll quote a small part here there is some of the same fitness in a man's building his own house that there is in a bird's building its own nest who knows but if men constructed their dwellings with their own hands and provided food for themselves and families simply and honestly enough the poetic faculty would be universally developed as birds universally sing when they are so engaged. But, alas, we do like cowbirds and cuckoos, which lay their eggs in nests which other birds have built, and cheer no traveler with her chattering and unmusical notes. Shall we forever resign the pleasure of construction to the carpenter? What does architecture amount to in the experience of the mass of men? I never in all my walks came across a man engaged in so simple and natural an occupation as building his house. I remember a quote, I don't know who said it, but I remember a quote that was something like, there is no bigger satisfaction to a man than building his own house. And today YouTube can really uh, teach us a lot about this and, and we can watch so many people having these experiences of building their own shelter, wooden houses, cabins, um, rammed earth, yurts, whatever it is. I think that's really a special satisfaction uh, when a person is able to build his own place and live in that. Um, I, I think I will forever regret not do that. I won't do that because I think you really need some resources, not only material resources, but also um, time, energy and of course knowledge on how to do it I could do it I could learn it and I could take the time but everything is always uh, a matter of priorities there's always a trade off with things you want to do and things you will delegate for other people to do or pay them to do and in our case here we decided to, to settle with a, a prefab wooden house which we'll get for a very nice price and very fast and so for us that will be that was a really great option because building our own house if I was living alone I'll be honest if I was single and if I had no intention to be with somebody and, and not have kids I would definitely take that risk and build my own house because it will be something so simple like Thoreau, like um, David Pronicky uh, I think it, 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 it really is special but when you have a family kids growing up you really need something more um, more stable more secure bigger and so if you don't have the skills if you're not a carpenter or a builder or you have a lot of people around you that can help that might be a challenge but anyway the role raises a very, a very valid point about that architecture that yeah, and it speaks a little bit more about it uh, the necessary complexity of architecture and luxury houses when he builds his own house for such a small price and many times reutilizing materials that he found or that people gave him or that he bought really really cheap and this whole part about economy and architecture he goes on and he gives it a very detailed description about all the costs he had he breaks down all the costs with all the materials and what he spent and it's it's um, it's really interesting is to see his account uh, in that detail. 
I'm gonna just skip a little bit further. He's still talking about his his livelihood and his income. And let me just see where I was going to start. Now, yeah. So yeah. So he again he says how simple it can be just to survive with with the basic needs. And he says the next year I did better still, for I spaded up all the land which I required, about a third of an acre. And I learned from the experience of both years, not being in the least awed by many celebrated works on husbandry. Arthur Young, among the rest, that if one would live simply and eat only the crop which he raised, and raise no more than he ate, and not exchange it for an insufficient, ins insufficient quantity of more luxurious and expensive things, he would need to cultivate only a few rods of ground, and that it would be cheaper to spade up than to use oxen to plow it, and to select a fresh prod spot from time to time, then to manure the old, and he could do all his necessary farm work as if it were with his left hand at odd hours in the summer. And thus he would not be tied to an ox, or horse, or cow, or pig as at present. So again, it's, a, it's all about when you live simply, and you consume less, and you eat only what you need, then you can save on other resources. Like here, he uses the example because it's, it's about the context, right, and the, and the era where, when he lived, the people used oxen and the horses and, and other animals for farm work, which today is being replaced by machinery, which is, in a way, even more expensive because now you you need petrol, you need uh, all kinds of oil-based stuff so that so that the machinery works. So again, it's always that idea that the more you think you need or the more you consume then the more you need to work to pay for that consumption right another following a little bit on this thought uh, he has some other interesting paragraphs nations are possessed with an insane ambition to perpetuate the memory of themselves by the amount of hammered stone they leave. What if equal pains were taken to smooth and polish their manners? One piece of good sense would be more memorable than a monument as high as the moon. I love better to see stones in place. The grandeur of the Thebes was a vulgar grandeur. More sensible is a rod of stone wall that bounds an honest man's field than the hundred gated Thebes that was wandered farther from the true end of life. The religion and civilization, which are barbaric and heathenish, build splendid temples. But what you might call Christianity does not. Most of the stone a nation hammers goes towards its tomb only. It buries itself alive. As for the pyramids, there is nothing to wonder at in them, so much as the fact that so many men could be found degraded enough to spend their lives constructing a tomb for some, for some ambitious booty, whom it would have been wiser and manlier to have drowned in the Nile, and then given his body to the dogs. So he's quite uh, <laughs> um, strict in his, in his view here that, yeah, again, the same thing, but now in, in a larger scale of, of nations, so many resources, so many man hours of work, and in, in this case of hammering stone to build these big monuments, as if you're perpetuating um, that nation or, or the life of that nation, or the life of that emperor or whoever built that monument. And if and what Thoreau asks is, what if all that energy, all that dedication, was towards improving ourselves? instead of just building. And so he says like he prefers to see the stone in its natural place than being carved and hammered to build monuments. So one page ahead, Thoreau goes and gives a very detailed breakdown of his expenses of all the food that he bought and that he used to eat utensils, clothing, etc. And then his income of earned by day labor and his 
final balance. And one thing I, I well, it's not it's not exactly the same, but one thing I've I've always tried to do as as this part of making a, a simple life um, is again this thing which I repeatedly talk about of the less you need, the less needs you create for yourself in terms of um, consumption, then the less you need to work to support those needs, to pay for those needs. And one thing that I've been trying to do and increasingly doing is to make homemade versions of things that sometimes I buy. And then I've been trying to find out how much I'm saving on those things. And yeah, it's not a lot. I mean, it's not like I'm cutting my budget in half or anything like that. But there are some savings being done. And when you see that at the end of the month or over a year, it, it amounts to something significant. Um, especially when you're trying to reduce the amount of work you do. You're, in my case, I... I'm self-employed and I do different kinds of stuff so I don't have a fixed salary uh, I don't have a stable income so anything I can cut to try to reduce the amount of expenses I have is useful and some of the things just for enumerating a few examples uh, we eat yogurt and we usually buy this um, small individual cups of yogurt which we usually come in six packs and maybe we go through 10 yogurts in a week. 10 yogurts in a week is about, I would say, maybe 4 euros. Um, so, 4 or 5 euros, yeah, maybe 4, maybe 5, maybe 5. So, in a week, so at the end of the month, you multiply by 4, you have about 20 euros in yogurt. Now, what I'd started doing was to do yogurt at home which is really easy to do so instead of buying the, all these individual cups of yogurt which is, are also producing a lot of plastic waste I get a mason jar glass I use one liter of fat milk non-skimmed milk and I do the yogurt at home and we have fresh yogurt every two days it can last three days but usually we, we finish it before that so when I buy the milk it us it's usually about uh, 70, 70 cents and it lasts for three days more or less in terms of yogurt so all in all I'm saving like uh, I'm cutting in half the expenses of yogurt more or less I've, I've done this account before um, I'm cutting it in half so if I, if I was spending about 20 euros I'm maybe spending about 10 euros so I have 10 euro savings a month, which amounts to 120 euros per year, just for the yogurt. Now I started doing the same with bread. We, we tend to eat a lot of bread, even though it's not the healthiest thing, but um, it's really part of the culture, I guess. And we usually were spending maybe, maybe one euro a day on bread, just an average when you were a day, which means about 30 euros a month bread. And I started doing at home, uh, using sometimes using pre-made uh, flour mixtures for bread, sometimes doing my, uh, the mixture myself. In both cases, although there is a slight difference in both cases, I'm again cutting the price in half. So instead of 30 euros a month, I'm getting maybe 15, 15 euros a month for the bread, which means 15 euros savings plus 10 of the yogurt, that's 25 euros a month savings. Other thing I've been doing is sauerkraut, which I love. I have a recipe, a video, if you want to check that out, how to do sauerkraut at home. There are plenty of them in YouTube. And I get one jar like this size sauerkraut in the supermarket for 5 euros. I can do like triple that amount for 1 euro. It's a ridiculous amount of savings. Uh, so that's like maybe 5, 10 euros a month in terms of savings. So from 25 we go to 30, 35 euros a month. So we're talking here about almost four, 400 euros per year savings. 
just with these three items, okay? Now I've been trying to find other other ways to um, other ideas to do at home, and I'm still um, once we move to the land, I want to do more canning, preserve uh, vegetables. I think that will help a lot. Uh, I have a, a dry um, de de dehydrator made by myself in with wood, and I want to preserve fruit like that also in order to spend less. And there are many other things. I've been trying vinegar. I made my first vinegar test. Um, two months ago I started. It, it finishes maybe two weeks ago. I think it's ready. But but uh, that, you know, it's good to do at home. You control, you you, you taste it. it it's, it's a nice experience. Although in, in the in case of vinegar, you don't really have a lot of savings because I can buy one jar of, one bottle of vinegar for like 50 cents. So it's not significant. Um, but there are other things which are more significant and it's good. And once we have, of course, our vegetable garden working and we can produce our own vegetables, or at least part of them, then we can again reduce more of what we, consu or what we consume. And as I, again, as we reduce what we consume, then there is less need for income and to work more to pay for that consumption. Um, one last thing. Before we finish this session, where is it? It's here. So, in conclusion, Thoreau says, In short, I am convinced, both by faith and experience, that to maintain oneself on this earth is not a hardship, but a pastime, if we live simply and wisely, as the pursuits of the simpler nations are still the supports of the more artificial. It is not necessary that a man should earn his living by the sweat of his brow, unless he sweats easier than I do. One young man of my acquaintance, who has inherited some acres, told me that he thought he should live as I did, if he had the means. I would not have anyone adopt my mode of living on any account. For beside that before he has fairly learned it, I may have found out another for myself. I desire that there may be as many different persons in the world as possible, but I would have each one be very careful to find out and pursue his own way, and not his father's or his mother's or his neighbor's instead. The youth may build or plant or sail, only let him not be hindered from doing that which he tells me he would like to do. It is by a mathematical point only that we are wise, as the sailor or the fugitive slave keeps the pole star in his eye. But that is sufficient guidance for all our lives. We may not arrive at our port within a calculable period, but we would preserve the true course. Undoubtedly, in this case, what is true for one is truer still for a thousand. As a large house is not proportionally more expensive than a small one, since one roof may cover one cellar and a lid, and one wall separates several apartments. But for my part, I prefer the solitary dwelling. Moreover, it will commonly be cheaper to build a whole yourself than to convince another of the advantage of the common wall. And he goes on for a little while. So again, I think this is a I think this concludes this first part really well. It's really the it's really the essence of simple living. Maintains oneself on this earth is not a hardship but a pastime. You know, this is always discussable, of course. It's not like we are agreeing one hundred percent. But that's what I think philosophy and philosophers uh, make us do is to question things, is to dream in a different way, to ponder, to ask questions. And, and I think Thoreau does that really well. I mean, it's not like I will agree 100% every, everything he says, but the way he presents things makes us question about how complex are we unnecessarily uh, making our lives when they can be much simpler. So this finishes this first part. The second part which will continue soon, I hope, 
with not so many months in between, is called Where I Live and What I Lived For. So this is Walden, or Life in the Woods. By the way, if you're really interested in Henry David Thoreau, I just began reading one uh, very special biography of Thoreau, completely different from all the others. It touches a lot of mystical aspects of Thoreau's life and gives you a really different perspective. I highly advise you to read. It's called Expect Great Things. You can search for the book or the ebook. I don't remember the name of the other, I'm sorry. Uh, but I highly recommend you to read it if you appreciate Thoreau's work and, and his thought. Expect Great Things was actually one of Thoreau's uh, one own uh, writing in one of his diaries, if I'm not mistaken. And it really is, is that mythical aspect of his life that I find so interesting. That he is always open to mystery, to what life is going to bring today. Something new will happen today. Expect great things. Have a nice day. Thank you.